the president of East Africa Law Society, uh, Bernard Wundo, the council, together with um, our distinguished panel this afternoon. My name is Francis Gimara, and I welcome you to this webinar. This is uh, a webinar that has been put together once again by the Council of the East African Law Society, led by our president, uh, Bernard Wundo. And on my own behalf, and on behalf of East African Law Society, I welcome you to a very engaging afternoon of learning. Today, they say that the best mindset is a mindset that is continuously learning. And by putting these webinars together, the East Africa Law Society has ensured that we keep learning to be better lawyers, but also most importantly, to be relevant to our clients. Talking about relevance to clients, friends, wherever you are joining in this afternoon, we are very much honored to have a very distinguished panel that I will be introducing shortly on this topic regarding the Africa continental free trade area, an update to lawyers. As you are aware, friends, that on 1st January 2021, the Africa continental free trade area started trading and an agreement that had been that entered into force on 30th of May 2019. On 1st January, after the requisite minimum numbers were reached, the trading block commenced. And so far, we are in a place where this is no longer an idea, but the agreement has actually rolled off. Importantly, let me highlight, just for all of us to understand, about a few, the, the, the objectives of the Africa continental free trade area. The first one is that it is aimed at creating a single market to deepen the economic integration of the continent. The agreement also has the objective of establishing a liberalized market through multiple rounds of negotiations. The agreement also has the objective of facilitating the movement of capital and people and investment throughout the continent. The agreement also has one of its objectives, establishing a future continental customs union. The agreement is also aimed at helping Africa become sustainable and have social, economic, development. Sorry? In, uh, even, no, I don't have both of them. The agreement, among others, also aims at resolving the challenges of multiple and overlapping memberships and expedite the regional and continental integration process. As you know, before this agreement, we have been majorly organized through regional economic blocks. But uh, it is envisaged that through this agreement, we will use those regional economic blocks as building points for an Africa-wide integration. Now, what is our spotlight this afternoon? We can talk many things about the agreement. But today, we are particularly uh, focused on an update to lawyers. We want to understand what opportunities are available to the lawyers. We have assembled a great panel 
and I'll be introducing each one of them before they talk to us. But at this stage, I would just like us to go through the formalities. And the first thing is to invite the president of the East African Law Society, Mr. Bernard Dohundo, to give us some opening remarks. And then I will be back to uh, the, the main thrust of our discussion this afternoon. So welcome, Mr. President. Uh, speak to the audience from wherever you are. Thank you, President Emeritus, uh, Mr. Francis Jimara of the Uganda Law Society. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm happy to welcome you to yet another year migration and trade law series focuses on the African continent of free trade area, the current status of its implementation, and what lawyers should be paying attention to today. We are very pleased this afternoon to be joined by Ms. Petina Agapa, who is the principal legal advisor. We, we are also pleased to be joined by very distinguished panel of but to mention Honorable Dan, Ms. Esther Katende, and Ms. Rose Rono. At the East Africa Law Society, we believe that supporting regional integration is critical, is critical to harnessing increased opportunities for the legal profession within the region. The African Free Continental Trade Area presents a tremendous amount of opportunities for lawyers in the region in the form of increased business and eventually free movement of legal services across African borders. With the African Free Continental Trade Area, Africa is on the cusp of securing a destiny of growth and self-sufficiency. And the legal profession has a special duty to be agents for the favorable business environment that the free trade area will require to succeed. As lawyers members will be required to support a business environment in which investment and collaboration are done seamlessly and with minimal risk and legal conflict. To do this, we must position ourselves as enablers for this environment and build our capacities so that we can seize the opportunities on the horizon. In our quest to promote the best interests and professional development of its members, the East African Law Society is acutely aware of the need for constant reskilling of its members in line with changing economies and other developments. Critical discussions are one in which we ensure that our members trends, practice areas, and opportunities for growth. In light of the African Free Continental Trade Area, regional integration at the level of the ESC, the Great Reset Agenda, and other developments, we believe that one of the areas in which our members should obtain additional training is international trade and investment law. In line with these objectives, we are also doing a number of things. Formalize the partnership with the Trade Law Center and that is renewed for its custom design is, uh, is going to be on a short course on reading and this may I encourage all our members to apply for it to be part of designed to build capacity and investment law our commitment to you as the East Africa Law Society is that we'll continue to support your professional development and reskilling in line with the regional and global trends so that at all times the society poses the expertise that is needed to serve East Africa, Africa, and the world. I welcome you once again to this webinar and I also look forward to this discussion. Thank you, Mr. Francis Jimara, President Emeritus of the Uganda Law Society, for allowing to moderate this very important discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, President Oundo and uh, 
again, uh, together with your council, thank you so much for bringing this uh, very critical topic for discussion to update the membership uh, all over East Africa and also others from Africa, wherever they are. Now, of course, there's been a debate that, you know, what is the rationale of, uh, of, of this agreement? You know, is it something that is just being done again as a result of uh, uh, the trend or is it something that uh, potentially uh, has uh, uh, keys that will unlock Africa for Africans? I think that um, many people have uh, come to a point where this agreement is seen as an opportunity on very, very many fronts. I think that uh, perhaps you should, if you have time, to try and read the report by the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. That report published last year says that this agreement has the potential of just increasing intra-African trade by uh, 52% by 2022. So just from that alone, you can see that the opportunities the, uh, the agreement has for, for Africa are remains. Beyond that also, we have to look at, 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 at this agreement as positioning Africa to be able to meet its trade potential. Because uh, as you know, Africa has had quite a historical legacy of disputes, of wars, but today not many things are said about Africa in terms of the past. One of the main rationales for this agreement is, is to take advantage of, of, of Africa's market growth. For instance, six of top 10 fastest growing economies today are African economies. We also have the world's most Grow, uh, the fastest growing population, you know? It's expected that by 2060, we will have 2.75 billion people. That can also be seen in terms of market for goods and services. Beyond that, it is projected that the, the continent's gross domestic product, GDP, is forecast to grow from USD 3 trillion in 2020 to United States dollars, 16 trillion by 2060. So you can just see that from the projections done by economists, uh, this agreement uh, is uh, timely in a way that it is positioning Africa to benefit from the opportunities that exist within Africa. So for us lawyers, it's not business as usual. It is time for us to update our knowledge. It's time for us to be relevant to our countries. It's time for us to be relevant to, uh, to the needs of, 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 of the business people who want to seize these opportunities. And I say this because uh, in the recent past, we have been um, just talking amongst ourselves in Africa. The Africa Law Practice Group, which, which I head, in East Africa has, uh, for instance, without fear of any contradiction, just benefited from talking with fellow Africans across <coughs> Africa. Today, we have uh, partners in Nigeria, partners in Zambia, and I can tell you and, and use the word testify that that engagement has been very productive for us, you know, as, as East Africa. So what do we need to do as lawyers? We need, number one, to unlearn and learn. Number two is to listen in to the experts. They will tell us what is trending, and then for us, we will then listen and seize the opportunities, package them for ourselves, package them for our clients. And that is what we are here to do this afternoon. We want to listen to the experts, we want to take away as much as we can. And some of these things, I remain optimistic that they will help you inform your Africa strategy or your practice within your country as far as supporting clients who want to take benefit from this agreement. 
So allow me this afternoon uh, begin by um, introducing uh, the panel that we have. Uh, we have uh, quite a rich panel, I must say, and uh, I will start off by introducing the one who will speak first. We have a keynote, uh, uh, keynote speech that uh, will be uh, that will receive this afternoon. But as uh, the, the person who delivers the keynote prepares to come, let me begin by introducing uh, one of uh, the experts in this area. And that is none other than Esther Katende Magezi. Esther Katende Magezi will speak first, and I will uh, say a few things uh, about her. Esther is a trade lawyer, and she is as well a postgraduate and undergraduate lecturer of international trade law at Makerere University Business School and at the Trade Policy Training Center in Africa. She holds a master's degree in international trade and investment law from the University of Western Cape, South Africa, a diploma in legal practice from LDC, and a law degree from Makerere University. Esther has comprehensively trained in trade law. She is no doubt a specialist, and she holds various awards related to this specialism. She has a certificate in WTO dispute settlement issued by the World Trade Organization, a certificate in public international trade law issued by the International Development Law Organization, and a certificate in trade negotiation skills issued by the World Trade Organization, among others. She has over 15 years of experience in international trade law and policy matters, and has been instrumental in several trade and policy-related work in Uganda, including drafting in our national trade in services policy. She has also drafted the Uganda model, model investment agreement. She has undertaken many gender and trade studies for Trademark East Africa. And she has as well done policy work for ESC, SADAC, and uh, among, the, among the others, our Ministry for East African Community Affairs. She is an advocate of the High Court of Uganda, and as you have heard, is very passionate about African countries improving their active participation in world trade issues. Friends, we couldn't have thought of uh, uh, no better person than Esther to share with us her perspectives, particularly around uh, uh, services and nailing it down to the opportunities for lawyers. So Esther, over to you to make your remarks and share with us your experience in these matters. Thank you very much, Francis. Um, it's an honor to be here. I would like to share my screen um, so that you can see what I'm looking at as well. Uh, my assignment today is really to talk about professional services, the opportunities that lawyers have. And in doing this, I'm mainly going to first explain what services are being considered in the trading services protocol negotiations. So we have business services, we have tourism, we have communications, transport, and finance. And these are the services that have been dealt with as the first, in the first, they face the negotiations, especially for services. So they've started with business services, tourism, communications, transport, and finance. And under business services, that's where our professional services fall. So you find that they are talking about, for example, accountancy, medical and dental services, legal services, auditing, taxation, architectural. In this slide, I'm showing you what the offers that have been made so far. Just an example. You find that, for example, Zambia has not 
opened up their legal services. In other words, they're not opening their legal sector to foreign players from other African countries. Now, the distinction with trading services is that parties, as opposed to trading goods, trading services that parties are permitted to choose which sectors they want to open up. They're permitted to say that we can open up, we want the legal sector to have foreign players in it, or we don't want that. It's, it's like an a la carte or a buffet me method whereby you choose where you want to allow foreign participation. So you find in our case here, Zambia has not allowed, Eswatini has not permitted legal players, Mauritius has not permitted legal players. So this means that the legal players that are coming to these countries are going to continue as it has been all this time. They are following the existing immigration laws. So the countries that have opened up the services, for example, the legal services like South Africa, like Comoros in, in this example, you'll find that they have put special rules or special laws to permit foreign players in the African countries that are party to the CFTA to come in and participate in, 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 the, in their market. So what is happening at present before we go into the opportunities? So like I said, countries are making offers. And what do I mean by making offers? They are asking, they are, they are presenting which areas they are allowing other partners to come in and, and participate. You'll find, for example, Zambia, Mauritius, Namibia, Eswatini, as an example, like I said, they didn't open up legal services. So that means if you are a lawyer in East Africa and you want to go and do business in Namibia, you have to follow the existing immigration laws and policies. However, you find that Seychelles, for example, has limited, has opened up to legal, legal services. And by legal services, we're talking about judges, lawyers, legal clerks, legal analysts, and they're saying in Seychelles, they are only limiting that to legal advisory on foreign and international law. In other words, you cannot go to Seychelles and you start practicing their domestic law. So this is the limitation they have put, but they've still opened it up. And they're saying that if you're going to go as a legal person, that is under mode four, if you're going to go as a legal person, you're not going to stay for longer than one 28 days 128 days is your maximum number of days then you find comoros has also allowed open has also opened up its market but it is not allowing participation in domestic law now they are saying that they are going to open up after they have ratified five years after they've ratified that's for comoros and even now they have not yet ratified so this is what is permitted in trading services that countries are at liberty to decide how to open up to what percentage how many people are they allowing for how long so these are just examples. Now with East African community, remember because we are ESC, we make our offer as a regional block. Our offer is still in draft form. But so far what I've looked at is that Rwanda has opened up legal services, but the other countries have not opened up legal services. Um, I, hope, I hope you're following. I hope you're following. So what opportunities do we have? So what are the opportunities, the opportunities that exist? The opportunities that exist? One is there's better market access for the lawyers. In other words, if you look at this example of South Africa, in their, in their offer, they have said that they have, acted, for example, they say that they permit legal services in foreign and international trade law only, or international law. And they're saying that you can go and establish shop in, in South Africa and then they're also saying if you're lawyers or legal experts or judges, any legal persons, you're allowed to go there as long as their professional body has approved your qualifications. So this is for foreign and international law. And then they are saying for domestic law, they are saying you cannot go and establish a firm or a partnership that they have closed. But they are saying if you, the person, want to go and work, they are saying you can go and work as long as a professional association has approved you so we find here that there are opportunities of players in the in the african you know cfta that are willing to open their market and they are giving conditions and this is one of the conditions for example that is being given by south africa so you might feel that it's still restrictive but i wanted to contrast contrast it to the position before the cfta without the cfta what is the position Without the CFTA, you find that if you were to go now to work in South Africa, you need a visa or a work permit. And these are the requirements. So I try to list them so that you see how stringent it is to work without the CFTA so that you can appreciate that the CFTA is of benefit 
to the legal fraternity. If you're going just without the, the benefits or the preferential treatment of the CFTA, you need a written undertaking from the company that is taking you on that they'll cover any deportation costs in case that the South Africa is to deport you. You need a written undertaking from the company again to inform immigration of any visa defaults or any problems you commit. Sorry. You need another written undertaking to immigration in case employment terms change, the company must show it is registered. You have to have an employment contract that shows its condition to your work. That you have to have a supporting letter that says that for the job you want to take was put in national media. It was you know put in the national media. This evaluation, your, your qualifications must be evaluated by SACA. The Labor Department must confirm that the annual confirmation to the Home Affairs on your job, you know, as a, just a normal person, not as an intra, intra corporate transfer. But if you're going as a normal person to just difficult. However, with the CFTA, they are saying that once your credentials are approved by their professional body, then you can access their market. So that is an opportunity. And how are these credentials approved? You'll find that in, in all regional negotiations, they are what they call the MRA, the Mutual Recognition Agreement. And, um, and a mutual recognition agreement is simply a contract or understanding between regulatory bodies to approve or agree on the standards they are going to take. We did this in the East Africa. You find that the vets, the architects, the engineers all sign their MRAs, except the lawyers have not yet signed. But really, it's, it's, it's standardizing the qualifications and practice requirements so that if you're an approved player in, in, in the East African community, you can very easily just go to Nigeria and present your qualifications, and that is sufficient. So this means that it is an opportunity for us as lawyers because all you have to do is get in line with your, you know, all you have to do is align yourself with the East Africa Law Society or your country law society. Because once they have mutually recognized, they, they put the standards in a mutual recognized agreement, then once you fly with the East Africa Law Society, you can easily go and become a player in any other market within the east within africa so what is the opportunity here that i'm saying i'm saying that the opportunities is an opportunity to, to go to other markets in africa for the countries that have opened up those markets for legal players and the only thing you now have to do to prepare for this is to align yourself with the east africa law society why east africa because the east african community is presenting an offer as an east african community we're not making offers as kenya uganda rwanda tanzania no we are acting as a board. So what will be recognized with the, be the East African Law Society. So align yourself so that once the, the, the actual implementation is happening, you're good to go. That's one of the opportunities that exist. Now, another opportunity is that because the market is now bigger, the whole of Africa, 1.3 million people, foreign firms that are not in Africa are going to be interested in partnering with local players in Africa. So make sure you're part, you've aligned yourself again to be, or you strategize your business in such a way that you can be able to attract those non-African firms that want to participate in this bigger market. They've always said that Africa is now the virgin market, you know, it is now where the money is being made. So if that is true, that means players from Western, the Western world, India, Asia, all those people, if they want to participate in this African market, they are going to look for local partners. So align yourself in such a way that you are attractive to the people who want to partner with the local Africans so that they can benefit from this big market. The other benefit is that it's an opportunity for new partnerships, you know, because we are all opening up, whereas we are accessing other markets, even the East African community is opening up. They have not yet finalized the position for the ESC, but like I said, Rwanda, for example, opened up legal services. So it means new players are going to come into our market. New players are going to come into East Africa. So it means that you have to prepare to survive the increased competition. So you have to strategize your business in such a way that even when competition comes, you're able to stand. That's why I was talking about partnering with none with other players or whichever position you choose to to partake, but you have to strategize to be able to take on new partnerships 
or to take on you know the competition that is coming so that you're not wiped out because you're not now going to be playing with the big boys you know it's no longer just going to be east africa or just kenya or just uganda we are opening up so prepare your business in such a way that you're able to compete and not be wiped out by increased competition another benefit is that dispute settlement is now in africa you find that originally dispute settlement was in the western world and it was quite expensive but now because it's in africa as my colleague rose is going to talk about the dispute settlement um, benefits and process you find that now there is an opportunity for arbitrators because it's in africa it's easy to get arbitrators in africa because it's cheaper for government to pay their people in africa and for arbitration to be in africa as opposed for a bit as opposed to the arbitration being abroad it used to cost government so much money to for example hire a lawyer in uganda then take them to um, paris maintain them in paris for a year while they are negotiating a matter or while they are handling a, an arbitration but right now the arbitration is in africa dispute settlement according to the cfta is in africa so that means that if there's an opportunity for you to become an arbitrator or to become a lawyer in an arbitration process it is going to be easier to be picked on in africa because it is now cheaper it costs the range between 40 and 80 pounds an hour that is good money so it is an opportunity for us to strategize and be part of that arbitration process let it not pass us by let us market ourselves and you know hone our skills and our competencies so that when they are looking for arbitrators we are picked another opportunity there's an opportunity for funding for medium and small enterprises now your clients might be this kind of people or even you, you could have a side business and there's a lot of funding that's going around from you from the development partners to be able to support these smes so that they can understand and benefit from the cfta so inform the people you know who have small businesses that there's an opportunity for them to be helped or supported so they're not wiped out by the CFTA. So this is another opportunity that you can also take on if you have other businesses, just businesses that are outside legal practice. Because member states are mandated to sensitize their nationals, to support their nationals, UNDP is supporting nationals, they are supporting businesses, for example, in tourism and other sectors, so that they can be able to benefit successfully from the CFTA. So this is not a legal opportunity, but it's an opportunity for your clients or for yourself if you're doing other businesses like many of you are doing that are outside legal practice um there's just an opportunity to direct dictate the narrative now you find that like i said the east african community offer is still being made so it means there's still an opportunity to have your voice you know it is important that we participate in the making of the laws that affect us so if you feel as tanzania you don't want um, a lot of foreign intervention in the legal practice. Make your views known now because the process is being made now. The laws are being shaped now. So participate in the process, participate in the negotiations and shape the destiny of your world while it's still possible. You'll find that because it's trading services, you're permitted to allow, for example, you can say we only want 200,000 lawyers, foreigners in total. You are, you're permitted to put certain restrictions even as you open up. So it's an opportunity to dictate the narrative now, to participate and, and know that this works for us and this doesn't work for us. That concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening in. Thank you so much, Esther, for indeed uh, sharing with us those opportunities. We will uh, park at that for now, Esther. We will, uh, I'm sure there will be questions at the end. Uh, hang in there, and uh, I am very sure that many people will want to ask a few questions or make comments. But uh, allow me, friends, to move to our keynote this afternoon. The keynote will be delivered by a person who is not only a lawyer, but a writer. Uh, allow me, with humility, introduce uh, Petina Gapa. Petina Gapa is a Zimbabwean lawyer and writer. She is a graduate of the universities of Cambridge. Uh, that excites me a lot. Cambridge excites me a lot. But that's a discussion for another time. Uh, Graz and Zimbabwe. She is an international lawyer with more than 15 years of experience in international law. And um, 
uh, in international law. Um, she completed a PhD on regulation of investment and competition policy from uh, a WTO perspective. Since then, her legal career has been in the law of the WTO. Accordingly, she has built formidable knowledge of the WTO legal regime and dispute settlement system. From 2002 until 2016, she was one of the pioneer counsel at the WTO law, where she represented WTO members as litigants before panels and the appellate body. She has taught trade law to government officials and provided extensive legal advice on their WTO rights and obligations. And she has done this to more than 70 developing countries from Africa, Asia, as well as Latin America and Caribbean. Our keynote speaker is as well an award-winning author. Those of you who have read Out of Darkness, Shining Light, the Book of Memory, you will uh, definitely be pleased that uh, the author is with us this afternoon. She has also written two short collections, Rotten Row and An Elegy for Easterly. Her work, friends, has been shortlisted for Orwell Prize, the Sunday Times EFG Short Story Award, the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, the Pen Stroke Open Book Award. She has as well been a recipient of the Guardian First Book Award and as well a prize from the Society of Authors. She currently serves as the principal legal officer of the AFTA Secretariat, that is the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat. She is going to make this key note address on behalf of the Secretary General, Ambassador Wamekele Mene. So Petina Gapa, we are privileged to have you on this webinar, and it is my singular honor to welcome you to make the keynote address to the participants who are online. Thank you. Uh, Francis, thank you so much. That is such a wonderful, wonderful introduction. I, I don't quite know what I've done to deserve it, but thank you very much. I'm afraid my internet is not great where I am. I am sitting in a little corner in a wonderful hotel called Labadi Beach Hotel, where we are currently conducting several meetings of the institutions of the AFCFTA. So you've, uh, I've actually had to walk out of a meeting to be able to join you. So if the internet goes funny, please, um, please let me know. I I'm very honored to be speaking to the East African um, Law Society. I was listening to the wonderful presentation by Rose and I would actually love to have a copy of it because I certainly learned a lot uh, in terms of what the services offers have been and how they affect the legal, legal profession. Um, and what Rose was saying was very interesting to me to understand just how lawyers can take advantage of the services components of, um, of the agreement. But there's also another way in which lawyers can take advantage, and we can talk about that a little bit later, which is in the legal advice. You know, the space has been opened up now for trade law as a field of real seriousness in Africa. And so the kind of work that I have been doing for the last 20 years can now be done for Africa, which is, a, which is an extraordinary, extraordinary thing. Um, in my entire career, I probably only represented two African countries before a WTO dispute, and those were Chad and Benin uh, in the Cotton case. But we're going to find as we implement the AFCFTA agreement that there may be even more disputes amongst African countries themselves and there is a real opportunity for lawyers uh, to get involved. So we can talk about that a little bit later. I'm now going to put on uh, 
my South African accent and pretend to be the Secretary General of the AFCFTA, His Excellency Wamkele Mene, because I am giving this speech in his name. And this speech is an adaptation of the speech that he gave to our dispute settlement body, which held its inaugural meeting yesterday. So ladies and gentlemen, President of the East Africa Law Society, all the office holders here present, I am honored and delighted to be speaking with you this afternoon on the occasion of this webinar on the AFCFTA. Firstly, as a lawyer, it gives me a lot of pleasure to see the great interest that especially the East African region has in the, in the AFCFTA. And it's quite interesting to me because by definition, the East African community should not be interested in the continent at all, because you are one of the fastest at integration. You have an East African community. It's possible to drive within the borders of uh, the East African community without feeling that you're leaving different countries. And there's a famous story, I think you may know this, about President Ro uh, Kagame tasking somebody to pretend to be a truck driver driving from Kigali to the coast to count the number of stops on the way to the coast. And it was one of the impetuses behind his particular interest in integrating East Africa to make it a borderless zone. So East Africa is always the leader on integration in Africa. So it's particularly exciting that uh, its key law society is taking such an active interest in the AFCFTA. And we hope that the interest is maintained. You know, I, I am a lawyer uh, who is passionately committed to the egalitarianism of treaty-based legal regimes in which there's no first among equals. Such regimes are based on the principle of international law that we call Pacta Sunt Servanda, or the willing and partial suspension of sovereignty to pursue a common good, and in pursuing that common good, a willingness to be bound by common rules based on shared values. And this is the ethos behind all treaty-based regimes, such as the AFCFTA. A group of countries get together, they agree to suspend sovereignty in certain cases in order to pursue a certain good. But in order to achieve the objectives of the treaty-based regime, it's important to have secure, transparent, and predictable dispute settlement. And this is why the AFCFTA takes dispute settlement extremely seriously. Two days ago, on the 26th of April on Monday, we held the inaugural meeting of the dispute settlement body. The DSB, for those who may not be familiar with it, is the organ of the AFCFTA that will be responsible for the surveillance of implementation of the commitments made by state parties over a range of different areas, including market access, investment, intellectual property rights, and implementation of the free trade agreement. Rose already took us through some of the offers, for instance, made in the services sector. If those offers are not being implemented, if those offers are not being We seem to have lost um, lost uh, our keynote speaker. She had earlier on um, told us about uh, the challenges of speaking where she, she is at the moment, uh, internet issues, but she will be back. Uh, as we wait for her, I am going to be introducing our other panelists and uh, our uh, our panelists will speak to us about really 
the opportunities existing within uh, the dispute settlement mechanism, something that uh, uh, the keynote speaker had uh, commenced, you know, highlighting. Uh, our next speaker, uh, friends, uh, is uh, somebody who may not be <laughs> new to most of us. Uh, well, you, you, she's a great East African and by extension uh, African. Uh, she's known as Rose C. Rono. Rose is very passionate uh, trade policy professional and has worked in Kenya for over 17 years, you know, in both the public and the private uh, sector. Uh, she has extensive experience in trade policy, cross-border trade, regional integration, ICT for trade. She also very experienced in stakeholder engagement, marketing and communications, government service uh, delivery, something that we will need a lot in the new Africa, you know, making our governments uh, deliver services more effectively. It's good that we, we have people like Rose who have been at it for quite a number of years. Rose, her recent activities involve being a member of the Kenya Government Committee for negotiation and implementation of the AFCTA. She is chair, the chairperson of the Information and Transparency, Transparency Subcommittee of the National Trade Facilitation Committee which is responsible for implementation of the World Trade Organization. She is a member of the National Trade Negotiation Committee in Kenya, and she currently works at Kentrade, a government agency under National Treasury in the capacity of Director Trade Facilitation. She has previously worked as the Corporate Communications Manager at the Catholic University of Eastern Africa. She has also worked as a regional officer at Kenya Power. She has also worked as brand manager at the Standard Group, which as well runs KTN. And she has been the head of marketing and communication at Vajas Manufacturers Limited. Rose is a business management PhD candidate at Moore University. She holds a master's in business administration and as well an executive diploma in marketing, project management certificate and professional certificate in international trade. She has represented Kenya at the World Trade Organization Ministerial Conference in Nairobi. And she is as well an international trade professional fellow, uh, a trade law African center uh, alumni, and we can say many things about Rose, but Rose will be speaking to us this afternoon and she will share her rich experience from the private and the public sector. But now that uh, our keynote speaker is back, I'm going to pause Rose for a moment <laughs> and allow our keynote <laughs> to resume her address to us. So Rose, you will, uh, I will indulge you. You will just thank uh, you. That and then return later. So let's continue. Thank you, Petina. Petina is my teacher, and I'm so happy to see her. Yeah, Petina, welcome Rose, back. Rose, how amazing <laughs> to see you. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much, and thank you so much, Rose, for indulging me. I last saw you in Arusha, and I'm happy to say you passed your exam. So that's some very good news there. Um, th thank you so much again, uh, Francis. I'm so sorry I got cut off. As I had explained, I'm in a tiny corner of the of the hotel. Uh, yeah. But let me let me just go through um, quickly to say that um, the DSB, which we launched on Monday, is uh, one of the most important organs. And it was deliberately created as the sui generis body that is not a subcommittee. So it is basically the legal face of the Council of Ministers, which is the highest implementing body before the assembly of the AU member states, right? So the body is responsible, just like the DSP of the WTO, and to, it's responsible for adopting panel reports and recommendations, having first established panels. It also has the role of, of establishing an appellate body. 
standing appellate body, just like at the WTO. Um, so it is the organ of the AFCFTA that will cement the rule of law for Africa. Uh, I mentioned the WTO, and I will mention it a few times because the structure of the dispute settlement mechanism was inspired by the WTO. But the negotiators, and I'm very happy to say the negotiators learned from the mistakes of the WTO. So it, we have not done a copy and paste job. It's a, it's, it's a different dispute settlement mechanism based on some of the mistakes that we have learned and that we have seen at, at the WTO. So for example, I'm sure you're aware that the appellate body of the WTO has effectively been killed. It was killed by the Trump administration uh, as part of its intensely unilateral worldview they were dismantling all sorts of multilateral cooperation, whether it's the Paris Agreement or the WTO, even to the point last year of holding up the appointment of the Director General of the WTO, who had been chosen by the entire body. So what the US did with the appellate body is that they simply killed it by not appointing people to it. In other words, they acted like an African civil service. You know, there's this thing that African civil services do. You establish a commission, and then you decide it's not going to operate. So you simply starve it of resources, you starve it of people. And the US did exactly that with the appellate body. They simply refused to appoint members, new members, and they refused to even renew the terms of those that were, that were to be renewed. So at one point, you had like two appellate body members. And since a division is supposed to be members, that effectively killed the appellate body. And so this very important institution that was considered the crown in the jewel of the WTO has effectively died because one member chose not to, not to appoint members. So the way we have fixed that problem in our appellate body is to say, is to that, say that, that no member. member can block the appointment of an appellate body member. And so there's a, there's a safeguard that has been put into the appointment process so that if there's no consensus, Right. If there's no consensus on the appointing of members, there's a there's a safeguard that kicks in to make sure that the chairperson of the DSP consults and a member is appointed. So that that's one of the things we have learned. And then another thing we have learned from from the mistakes of the WTO is right at the end of the mechanism, members who are unhappy with implementation are allowed to retaliate. They are allowed to seek what is called the suspension of concessions and other obligations. Right, but there was a drafting mess in the DSU of the WTO, which meant that it was possible to seek retaliation even before the reasonable period of time for implementation had expired. Right, so that created a lot of problems. So, what uh, disputing parties would do if there was the possibility of retaliating, they would enter into what were called sequencing agreements to say, first we do this, then the reasonable period of time expires, then we go to the DSP, then we retaliate and so on. So we have fixed that by putting right at the end of our own uh, dispute settlement protocol, we have basically removed fixed time frames so that we've now allowed for a situation where the reasonable period of time expires and then a, a member can seek uh, retaliation. So we have also fixed that, that particular issue. And another very important point that my Secretary General would like me to emphasize, and especially to you lawyers, is that we are taking very seriously the first few articles of our dispute settlement protocol, which encourage the amicable settlement of disputes. So yes, we have put in place panel proceedings, uh, panel structure, we are going to establish an appellate body, we are going to encourage the adjudicative settlement of disputes. But at the same time, we are going to encourage alternative dispute resolution. We are going to encourage members to use actively the good offices of the Secretary General. We are going to encourage members to use conciliation and mediation. We are going to encourage members to seek uh, arbitration on discrete and distinct legal issues. We believe that this is important, uh, colleagues, uh, learned friends, because the African way of dispute settlement, especially at interstate level, is not to take each other to court. It's seen as very unbrotherly. It's seen as uh, not quite comradely. You can imagine President Gaddafi and President Mugabe going to the ICJ 
No, they would rather sit down and talk in a corridor of, uh, or in Addis somewhere. So we want to encourage that spirit of African cooperation by giving equal value to ADR, to alternative dispute resolution, by giving equal value to good offices, to conciliation, to mediation, and so on. And this, again, is where lawyers are going to come in very handy. Because one of the one of the big growth areas, um, I think, even in East Africa, is arbitration. For example, uh, lawyers as arbitrators and lawyers encouraging arbitration. Now, another way in which uh, lawyers, uh, I hope, you will become involved with the AFCFTA, is by making yourselves available as panelists, as arbitrators, as conciliators, and even as members of our appellate body. We are going to, in the next few weeks, we are going to send out invitations to our state parties to nominate each two members of, um, uh, of, of two nationals to our indicative list of panel, panelists. We have an indicative list of panelists that we maintain in the Secretariat. Uh, to be as possible. So we are hoping that lawyers in this room or those who are interested in taking part in a more active way, not just as advisors to private companies or to governments, but also being part of the system itself so that we are able to build the Africa we want. Now, in terms of who can qualify to be a panelist, uh, the agreement itself talks about having experience in law and in the international law, subject matter of the, of the agreements more broadly, whether it's investment, whether it's uh, rules of origin and so on. But the, the bottom line really is to say that we're looking for as wide an experience as possible. So we're not looking only at government officials, we're looking at private um, uh, people, people who've been in private practice, such as lawyers, we're also looking at people who've been in academia. So please don't feel that because you haven't worked for a government, you can't take part in intergovernmental dispute settlement. Uh, I am talking very quickly because I'm absolutely terrified that I'm going to cut off again. Um, and as I said, uh, good offices, conciliation, and so on are, are going to be hugely important. And uh, my Secretary General would like me to, to let everybody know that uh, his door will be open to any request for, for the use of his good offices. And, you know, listening to uh, the deliberations yesterday and the day before on the dispute settlement and, and reading the report that came out of that meeting has honestly made me as, as a lawyer extremely proud because it means to me it seems to me rather that Africa is coming of age. Africa is coming of age in the sense that we are no longer thinking of these commitments merely as presidential handshakes in the corridors, right? We're thinking of these commitments as legally binding, right? And we are setting standards for ourselves as Africans. We are inspired by international best practice, learning from the mistakes made elsewhere, but we are effectively setting standard, standards for ourselves. And we are set, setting standards for ourselves because we want to anchor ourselves in the predictability and the transparency of a rules-based system as we imagine into being the Africa we want. And the Africa we want is one in which promises are fulfilled and legal commitments are honored. The Africa we want is the one in which the work we do today is done always with an eye for tomorrow. Just like uh, those sommeliers, I don't know if many of you love red wine as much as I do, but those sommeliers who lay down wine that they know they're not ever going to drink, or the grandparents in our villages who plant trees whose fruit will be feasted on by their grandchildren, the work that the AFCFTA is doing, and particularly on dispute settlement, is not just for our generations, but it's for those to come and the ones after that. You know, learned friends, the stereotype of African trade pacts and other agreements is that we, all, we are all talk and we have no action, that we don't walk the walk. Well, I can assure you that in Accra, 
we will still talk because after all, disputes are resolved through dialogue, through engagement and active diplomacy, but we will also walk the walk and indeed we are going to run the run. And we're going to go the distance all the way to 2063 until we achieve the Africa we want. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop there and allow for an interaction because I'm sure there'll be many questions and I'll be very happy to answer any questions uh, specifically about how lawyers can be more actively engaged, but also more broadly about the AFCFTA. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Bettina. That has been awesome. You have brought us up to speed uh, regarding the opportunities, but also being able to deliver the keynote amid these uh, technological <laughs> challenges. And uh, we are most grateful to you. And uh, thank you so much. We will, of course, return to you uh, shortly. Uh, if you would, uh, you let's listen to um, uh, uh, Rose uh, share her My students. <laughs> and uh, since I read the past, I am not in doubt that you will live <laughs> up to your expectations. Uh, Rose, I think uh, let me invite you again, Rose, to, uh, to, to share with us your uh, your your take. And uh, I understand you will be really speaking to us about the role of lawyers. And uh, again, you will be drilling, the, uh, 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 anchoring your, your paper on the dispute settlement mechanism so that we can have a, a more firm understanding of uh, how we can engage the process and also how we can benefit from it. So Rose, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Francis, and uh, the whole of the East Africa Law Society. Uh, for having me today and for the wonderful introduction that uh, uh, that you gave me and uh, also for inviting Petina. Petina is, uh, I would consider her, you know, uh, in terms of expertise, she's uh, the, tra the, the trade lawyer number one in Africa. And uh, I think my concern is that she has mentioned most of what I'm going to, I was going to present uh, to you, but I will try to go into detail. I think most importantly, I, I think sometimes we assume people know what the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement is. So you will just allow me to take you through this for those who might not be able to understand it or have not maybe interacted so much with it because it's important we understand the basics even before we can uh, to interact as lawyers. So it's basically a free trade agreement that brings together 54 African countries to create a single uh, continental wide uh, market for goods and services to promote movement of capital. And I think this was uh, in realization that the levels of intra-African trade are by the African Union. And UNCTAD conducted a study some time back which showed that between African countries, the trade is around 16%. But when you look at Europe, uh, between European countries, it's around 70%. In Asia, it's around 60%. So you can already see that Despite us being neighbors, despite, despite us being a single continent, we were not trading uh, so much with each other. And that is what informed into this particular uh, uh, agreement and other good things that are contained in the Agenda 2063. Um, enter in, entered into force on 30th of May, 2019, when 24 countries ratified the agreement, that is two thirds of them. And then uh, the free trade ar uh, area is the largest in the world with the largest number of participating countries. There is nothing like this, you know, before. This, this is the first time it's being done. And that's why you see there's so much talk about it all over the place. Then uh, the operational phase of the CFTA was launched uh, by, by the African Union in Niamey in uh, Niger in 7th July, 2019. And uh, trade in the agreement was launched in January this year, 1st of January this year by the Secretary General. So negotiations on some of the aspects are still ongoing, rules of origin. Um, the negotiations were phased, uh, were phased and uh, phase one uh, uh, involved uh, negotiations in trade, or trade in goods, trade in services. And then phase two is going to have negotiations on uh, intellectual property rights, uh, competition, uh, e-commerce. Uh, I think those are the ones which are going to be in phase two. And these are very important because these are areas whereby you have quite a bit of disputes, especially on intellectual property rights and investment. So it will be important 
that you as lawyers are following uh, these negotiations, you are involving yourselves in government. One thing I see is that we are not involving ourselves so much. You know, when we go and negotiate or we call for stakeholder engagement, we are not having so much reporting from, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the society groups, you know, the legal society groups, we don't have them. So what happens is that we are relying on just, you know, one or two lawyers from the attorney general. So I'll just encourage you get, you know, the negotiations are not over, they are continuing. So get active and be it. So just in number so that you understand the magnitude of this agreement, it's going to affect 1.3 billion across 55 African, 55 African countries. Yes, Eritrea is not the, is the only country that has not uh, signed the agreement, but we are hopeful that in the future that they will sign. And then we have, the, uh, I was uh, informed that now we have 41 who have ratified the agreement, a combined GDP value of around US dollars 3.4 trillion. 30 million people in Africa will be lifted out of extreme poverty. You know that is a big thing that we have been dealing with in the continuity, you know, lawlessness and self-determination. So we are looking at 30 million being lifted out of poverty, raised income levels of 65 million others who live, you know, in less than, you know, $5 a day. Trade facilitation measures, you know, will be, you know, uh, one of the, the objectives is to reduce non-tariff barriers. So we'll be having simplification of customs procedures that would drive around 292 billion of the uh, 450 billion in potential income gains. So you can already see this is money coming uh, to us. Then Africa's income by 450 billion by 2035, increased Africa's exports by 560. For example, in Kenya, we are a net importer. You know, we import more than we export. So that imbalance, you know, makes us not very, you know, that's why so much on taxation you see KRA coming after you know wanting to get more and more out of you why because we are not generating income we are not producing locally to be able to export to get that foreign uh, exchange and this agreement is promising to do that for us okay to have uh, large wage gains for women you know the gender disparities that we have so the agreement also intends you know to be able to deal with those disparities that we have also boost wages for skilled and un unskilled uh, 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 laborers. Uh, in terms of the specific ob objectives and the, in the agreement, and you as lawyers, I encourage you get the agreement itself, get the text and read the text and understand it. I have a professor called Erasmus Gerald, who is based in Tralak, who always tells me that get the agreement, get the legal text and read it. So it will be important. At the end of the session, I have attached a link which has the agreement itself. So I'll share this presentation and you can be able to get it. It has the whole dispute resolution mechanism uh, uh, protocol, which you can be able to have a look at it and just understand what would be required of you as a lawyer in this space. The specific objectives of this agreement is to eliminate tariffs of, uh, from 90% of the trade that we have in the continent. And by this, we mean uh, when you're exporting and importing within, you know, uh, let's say you're uh, in Kenya, when you're exporting uh, to a country that you do not have an agreement with, like already outside the ESC, the tariffs sometimes can be quite high. And by tariffs, I mean duties, the duties that you have to pay to access that market. So this will be eliminated by 90%. So you can already see the opportunities that are going to be there. They are really non-tariff barriers. These are the complexity when you're crossing borders, you know, uh, legal instruments that sometimes uh, may, uh, unnecessary, but sometimes can act as, uh, you know, uh, non-tariff barriers. Also, the agreement promises to liberalize trade in services, and this is where you lawyers are uh, putting in place mutual recognition, like uh, like uh, Esther mentioned, to ensure that you can be able to work, uh, you know, anywhere in the continent. Then cooperate in investment, intellectual property rights, and competition. We have been so lagging behind as Africa, especially when it comes to investment, intellectual property rights and competition. So with this portal going to come, it will be able to assist us to even patent some of those technologies that are, were ours, but you know, were taken away. So uh, it's very important also. This is a very good objective that we have in the agreement. Also cooperation in all trade related areas, cooperation in customs matters, establish a mechanism for dispute resolution, which is very important. Uh, and is concerning of the legal profession, then establishing and maintaining an institutional framework for the implementation and administration of the CFTA. And this is where Petina is. The, the CFTA has a secretariat that was established in to uh, now specifically ensure that this particular agreement is implemented. You can imagine dealing with 54 African countries. 
you, you need a secretariat that will be able to follow up to ensure that each country is able to meet their, their commitment. In terms of how will the, the framework, uh, the, 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 work, the scope of the agreement, it covers trade in goods, trade in services, investment, and also e-commerce will be added uh, later and intellectual property, uh, intellectual property rights is there. Then the priority sectors, we have the finance sector, we have the uh, business, uh, the, the communications, we have transport, tourism, business services, that's where now we belong. And in terms of the first negotiations I mentioned, trade, uh, trade in goods were, and trade in services uh, negotiation was phase one, which uh, is coming to an end. Then phase two will have investment, intellectual property rights, uh, policy, and I, I am aware also they are going to add on uh, the e-commerce uh, because of the, the fourth industrial re re revolution, which requires us now to trade more uh, using uh, digital tools. I I've talked about the institutional framework. Uh, then uh, in terms of the instruments, we have the rules of origin. And basically the rules of origin are, uh, are the guidelines of which uh, in terms of goods, the goods that can be able to get preferential treatment. Uh, within the continent. So this, they are still currently under negotiation. I think the last time 81, around 81% are completed and we are hoping that it should be completed soon so that we can be able to trade under it. There's also the online uh, negotiation forum uh, with these current times of COVID, then uh, it, this was necessitated to have that forum that we can continue negotiating even in light of the transitions. Then online mechanism on monitoring and reporting and elimination of non-tariff barriers. Uh, this is basically a platform, an electronic platform. If you're a trader uh, and, uh, or even if you're, a, uh, you're uh, uh, a person who is exporting and importing within any of the African countries, countering a challenge, you can be able to report this particular challenge and it will be dealt with uh, by the secretariat together with the member, uh, the, the member state. Then there's a Pan-Africa Payment Settlement Scheme whereby uh, we have different currencies that are going to be you know, uh, participating this trade. So it was important to have a platform that makes it possible for African companies to clear and settle into Africa trade transactions in their local currencies. The Afrexim Bank is uh, currently running this project and it is working with several central uh, central banks in uh, in Africa to so that uh, uh, this uh, works. Then we also have the Africa Trade Observatory, which is an online portal that will provide entrepreneurs, policymakers, and other stakeholders up-to-date, reliable trade data and statistics as well uh, as information about exporters, importers in countries, basically information that you will need, you know, uh, to be able to take advantage of this agreement. So I'll take you through the status of Kenya, and I think by extension, the status of many of the ESC countries. Kenya ratified the agreement on May 10, 2018. Uh, we already sent uh, our tariff offerings to the uh, Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement Secretariat. And uh, yes, Kenya is participating, continuously participating in the negotiations, in the trading services, we, we, we are still participating and the rules of origin, we are still part of the negotiations because the negotiations are still. Then uh, Kenya and the ESC countries are unable to implement uh, the agreement due to non-ratification of the agreement by Burundi and Tanzania. You know we belong to a one, uh, we belong to a, a customs union. So we cannot be able to continue to implement without one of the member parties of the customs union having uh, already ratified the agreement. So we have Burundi and Tanzania not having ratified the agreement yet, but we are working very closely with them as, a, as a government officials to lobby to ensure that they are, uh, they are ratifying the agreement before end of June, so that it can enable us or release us to be able to implement. As you can see now, our hands are, are tied. Even if we want to go ahead, we might not be able to do much. And it's not an isolated case. The same case is there in, uh, in, in SACU, whereby Botswana has not yet ratified, and therefore we cannot be able, they can implement. So Kenya has developed a national implementation strategy with technical assistance for UNECA and TIMEA. So there's a draft strategy that will soon uh, be subjected to validation and stakeholder engagement so that you can be able to you know, give your input and see if, uh, it, if this is what you want. I'm also aware that the ESC has already come up with its own implementation strategy for this agreement and will be validated. So there are potential areas of partnership in, uh, uh, for development partners in assisting Kenya to implement the agreement. So we are not doing this in isolation. Uh, as, uh, as people who work in government, we are, we are doing it together with the private sector. KEPSA is part of us, Kenya National Chamber of Commerce and Industry, KAM. Uh, we have APSEA, the Association for Professionals. They are all part of this. And uh, in terms of implementation, we are working together even with 
and partners to ensure that we are implementing uh, this agreement. So I'll go to the what I was supposed to present today, which is uh, uh, took most of it away, uh, but I will try as much as possible to be able to uh, give it justice. Uh, on, uh, on the rules and procedures of the settlement of the dispute resolution mechanism, uh, the uh, settlement of disputes in the, the CFTA was heavily borrowed or adapted from the WTO, as Bettina mentioned. And uh, we have the Article 20 of the agreement that established the settlement mechanism for the CFTA. So some of the objectives of, of that is uh, to, it provides an, an administration of dispute settlement mechanism established in accordance with the article. Uh, Article 20 of the agreement and aims at ensuring that the dispute settlement is transparent, accountable, fair, predictable, and consistent uh, with the provisions of the agreement. And you heard what Pesina said, we make promises and we keep those uh, promises. And that is the, is the objective of this uh, uh, dispute settlement mechanism. In terms of the scope, the uh, protocol shall apply to disputes arising uh, between state parties concerning their rights and obligations under the agreement. So private uh, parties uh, will not be able to come to this uh, dispute settlement mechanism to be able uh, to bring their issues. The protocol uh, shall apply subject to special and uh, additional rules and procedures on uh, dispute settlement contained in the agreement to the extent that there is a difference between the rules and procedures of this protocol. The, the special or additional rules uh, procedures in the agreement, the special or additional rules and procedures pre shall prevail. So I'm not a lawyer, but I, I'm re really trying to give you what is in, in the agreement. The purpose, uh, I think we, we can go, we, you'll read the agreement in general. In terms of uh, the general provisions, uh, the, the dispute settlement mechanism, element in providing security, predictability in the regional trading system. And I think that's what all we are seeking for. Uh, as a trade expert, it, when you, what you're looking for in a regional trade agreement is predictability. You want to know that uh, the rules that you have set down will be followed and will be reciprocated. Uh, then uh, uh, other general provisions, recommendations or, or rulings made by the DSP uh, shall be aimed at achieving satisfactory settlement of, of dispute in accordance with the rights and obligations under the agreement, mutually agreed solutions, uh, uh, to matter in accordance with the consultation and dispute settlement provisions of this protocol shall be notified to the DSB. So just like the WTO notification uh, uh, requires to be done, then all resolutions for to matters formally raised in accordance with the consultation and provisions of this protocol, including arbitration awards, shall be consistent with the agreement. Requests for conciliation and good offices, mediation, and the use of dispute settlement procedures should not be intended to or considered as a contentious acts. So I think, uh, Petina, about this, as Africans, we like to first of all mediate and you know, arbitrate before we can be able to proceed to even higher levels. Um, so we will go to the, the DSP, the dispute settlement body. It has been established in the agreement under Article 20. Uh, it, uh, it, it is composed of representatives from state parties. And I think Petina mentioned that they are now going to uh, be sending out uh, um, a call for, for persons who want to be part of this. Then uh, the DSP shall have authority to establish dispute settlement panels and appellate body, adopt panel and appellate body reports, maintain surveillance of implementation of rulings and recommendations of the panel and appellate body, authorize the suspension of concessions and other obligations under the agreement. Uh, the DSB shall have its own chairperson and shall establish such rules of procedures as it deems necessary for the fulfillment of this, its responsibility. It shall meet as often as necessary. Where rules and procedures of this protocol provide for the DSB to take a decision, it shall do so by consensus. So you can see that uh, this, uh, the DSB decision by consensus, the DSB shall inform the Secretariat of any disputes relating to the provisions of, of the agreement. Then we have the Article 6 when, uh, in terms of uh, 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 dispute arising among uh, state parties. In the first recourse shall be to consultations with a view of finding amicable, amicable solutions. And we've already talk, talked about that. We are not going to rush fast you know, into, uh, into uh, legal suits, first of all, it will be through, you know, amicable, uh, so, so amicable discussion to be able to find out, uh, uh, find a solution. Then we have a consultation state parties with a view of encouraging amicable so solutions of disputes 
affirm their resolve to strengthen and improve effectiveness of consultation procedures employed by state parties. So this just talks about the equitable resolution, good offices, uh, that is Article 8, establishment of panels, I think we've talked about that. Importantly, the composition of panels, the secretariat shall upon entry into force of the agreement, establish and maintain an indicative list of roster of individuals who are willing and able to serve as panelists. And I think Petit Petina talked about that. Each state party may annually nominate two individuals to the secretariat for inclusion in the indicative lists. Uh, yeah. uh, so I think Petina also talked about that. The terms of reference of, of the panel, uh, the panels shall have the following terms of reference. And uh, unless the parties to the disputes uh, agree otherwise, uh, within 20, 20 days from the establishment of the panel, the, uh, they will examine in light of the relevant provisions of the agreement cited by the panelists to the dispute, uh, the matter referred to the DSP by the complaining party. So this is all contained in the agreement. And uh, for purposes of time, I do not want to go through it in detail. In terms of the functions, the functions uh, are there. Um, also, third parties, uh, the interest of all third parties to disputing, uh, to who are disputing, including third parties, shall be taken into account during the panel process. So, third parties' disputes can will also be taken into account. Then, in terms of the procedure for multiple complaints, where there is one more state party uh, requesting on the same issue, only one panel shall be constituted for this. Then, uh, procedures for the panel, the, the procedures for the panel shall provide sufficient flexibility to ensure an effective and timely resolution of disputes by, by the panels. Then right to seek information, the panel will have the right information from the state parties to be able to make sufficient decision. Also confidentiality is taken care of. Then in terms of reports for, of the panel, a panel shall consider the rebuttal submissions and arguments of the state parties uh, to a dispute and issue a draft report containing the descriptive section. Then adoption of the report in order to provide sufficient time for the state parties to consider the reports of the panel, the reports shall not be brought up for consideration by the DSP before the expiration of 20 days from the date which the panel uh, circulated uh, the report. So there's also an, uh, the body under uh, uh, Article 20, which is a, a, a standing appellate body, which uh, will be established under the, the DSP and shall hear appeals from the panel cases. So once the panel has issued a report under, under and a member party does not feel that uh, they, they are happy with it, they can appeal. And the appellate body shall compose of seven members, three of whom shall serve in any one uh, case. The person serving in the appellate body shall serve in rotation, and such rotation may, shall be de determined in working procedure of the appellate body. So I think you can be able to touch more on this. Uh, in terms of appeals, only parties to the dispute may appeal on a panel report, third parties which have notified the DSP of substantial interest in the matter, pursuant to paragraph two of the article 13 of this protocol may make written submissions. So that also talks about parties. We have the procedure for the appellate uh, review. Uh, the working procedures shall be drawn up by the appellate review in consultation, consultation with the chairman of the DSP and communicated to the state, state parties for their information. The proceedings for the appellate body shall be confidential. The conduct under this article shall not exceed 90 days. So you can already see timelines have also been put. So I think you can take time uh, to be able to read this. Then uh, the panel and the appellate uh, body recommendations where the panel and appellate body uh, concludes that a measure is inconsistent, it shall recommend that the state party concerning bring the measure into conformity with the agreement. So that is just a ruling that is made where a state party has been found to be uh, culpable for, for one thing or another. Then surveillance of the implementation of recommendations of the ruling state parties shall pro, uh, pro, uh, properly comply with the recommendations. Then compensation and sus suspension of concessions or any other obligations. Uh, for example, if uh, you know uh, uh, a matter uh, you know uh, resulted in loss of revenue or loss, then there are provisions for compensations. Then in terms of the DSP shall determine the remuneration and expenses of the panelists, arbitrators, and experts in accordance with the financial rules and regulations of the African Union. Then arbitration, parties to a dispute may resort to arbitration subject to their mutual agreement and shall agree on the procedures to the arbitration. Then technical cooperation, this is matters to, in terms of legal aid and uh, legal advice and assistance. Uh, there is also a provision for that which provides for assistance of state parties who may not be able to uh, to uh, 
bring up their matter on their own. Then uh, responsibilities of the secretariat, the secretariat will uh, have the responsibility of assisting the panel, especially in legal historical procedures, facilitate the constitution of panels and basically act as a secretariat to assist the, the uh, this body to be able to carry out uh, uh, its responsibilities. In terms of rules of interpretation, the, the panel and the appellate body shall interpret the provisions of the agreement in accordance to customary rules of interpretation of public international law, including the Vienna Convention, uh, the treaties 1969. So that is uh, the end. I'm not a lawyer, but <laughs> I attempted to, to take you through it. And uh, uh, if you have any questions, I'm glad Bettina is here who can also help me. Rose, that is certainly a fantastic uh, job you have done. If I had anything to award you, I would make you an associate lawyer this afternoon. Because you have done very well. And your lecture, Petina, should be very proud of you because you have uh, explained to us uh, what this is all about. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa Santisana. Now, we will go down to uh, 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 Esther, if you're there, we will, uh, we're supposed to have uh, Honorable Cheng online. Honorable Cheng is a member of parliament in Kenya, but as we speak now, he is still uh, in chambers, but that cannot stop us from, um, you know, having the discussion. I would like to ask you uh, our keynote, Petina, there is a question uh, on the chat by um, uh, Ivan Jakol, who is a practicing advocate in Uganda. His question is, will, that, will the dispute resolution mechanism be useful to African traders stroke businessmen in light of the fact that only state parties have locusts to bring matters before it? Um, uh, before it, I think uh, I also say uh, uh, also from the jurisprudence at the WTO, the African states barely use that forum or even uh, take on each other for that matter. I think uh, um, the fact is that uh, our history as Africa in filing matters um, uh, in WTO has not been uh, very rich. Maybe you may have to, to, you may wish to speak into that. What do you think from your expertise has been for that, uh, has been the cause of that? But also the whole issue of locus, that state, mm. state is something the lawyer is asking. And I know that he's asking that on behalf of very many lawyers on the call. So Petina, you can speak to us on, on, on those two issues. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you so much to Advocate Ojako. I hope you are related to Silva Ojako, who is my boss, the chief of staff to the Africa Continental Free Trade Area. And if you are, you come from a very sharp family. Um, you, you are very, very correct. And I'm so glad you highlighted the fact that it is only state parties that can access the AFCFTA dispute settlement system. It's a hugely important thing to emphasize because intuitively, it sort of doesn't make sense because who's really affected by market access issues? Who's really affected by trade protectionism? It's private parties, right? It's private companies. They are the ones who are affected. They are the ones who take advantage of access, uh, market access, right? And they are the ones who try to ensure that these international agreements are implemented. But here's the thing, because we're in the universe of treaties, Treaties, by definition, are either between state parties or between state parties and international organizations. And this particular treaty is between state parties. And that is why only state parties can enforce, can enforce it by taking each other to dispute settlement. But that's not the end of the story. You'll be happy to hear. One of the cases I did at the WTO when I was at the appellate body was the Brazil aircraft case. Now, it's one of a series of cases that occupied the WTO for about 10 years, back and forth, back and forth. There was Brazil aircraft, there was Canada aircraft, there was US and US, uh, and, uh, and there was a U EU and U US dispute on aircraft. Now you sort of think, well, what is the interest of these state parties in aircraft and so on? But really, the parties behind it, in Brazil, it was Embraer, 
you know, they, they, they make these teeny tiny planes. They're specialized in this, you know, like a small Embraer planes, right? In Canada, it was Bombardier Dash, who also makes small aircrafts. And so is a competitor to Brazil, to the Brazilian Embraer, right? In the US, it was Boeing. In the EU, it was Airbus. You know, they, they make the bigger, the bigger planes. So what was on the surface, a dispute between Brazil and Canada, the EU and the US, was actually a fight for competition between Airbus and Boeing and between Embraer and Bombardier Dash, right? And similarly, I took part in uh, representing the government of Thailand in a, in a sugar case in which we ended up dismantling the sugar protocol of the, which is part of the common agriculture policy of the EU, right? And behind that sugar case was the Thai sugar industry. Similarly, there was the same case going on at the same time involving Australia, involving Brazil, and there again, it was the sugar industries that took um, on, on the, the sort of the burden of pursuing the case through their governments. Now, Advocate Ojako, this is where it becomes really interesting for us as African lawyers. You ask, why don't African countries go to the WTO? It's for a very simple reason. The private sector doesn't push them. If the private sector pushed them, believe me, they would. If the private sector pushed them, believe me, they would. But African trade, as we, as many in this room will know, has been very rarely about value-added products. It's been mainly about raw products, agricultural products, because there we have duty-free, quota-free access to the EU. We have Agoa. We have this. We have that. It's when we add value to our products that things become very different. That things become very different, right? Um, what the case I mentioned earlier that I, I, I took part in on behalf of Benin and Chad was the cotton subsidies case. And there, it was rural farmers in Benin and Chad who were experiencing negative uh, uh, and if the negative effect and suffering serious prejudice because the price of cotton had been lowered because of excessive subsidies coming from the United States, uh, excessive subsidies on cotton from the United States. Now, it was really very interesting that there wasn't a, an industry group behind the cotton case in Chad. It was rural farmers. And it's one of the very rare exceptions in the WTO where smallholder rural farmers were the ones whose interests were being protected. Normally, it's big business, you know, anti dumping, safeguards. It's normally big business that's, that's, that's being protected. And that's been the missing link, uh, advocates, in, the, in, in dispute settlement in Africa. We don't have those big industry, uh, you know, bodies pushing for dispute. But we heard about the offers on the legal services. There's been also offers on banking on insurance and so on. Now you can imagine if some of the bigger players, Vodafone, MTN and so on, if they, their market access is affected, they will act, they will act. And that's why for me, it's very important to do this kind of outreach that you've kindly invited me to, not only to lawyers, but also to the private sector itself. So as the AFCFTA, we will be taking very seriously uh, the education and capacity building of the entire continent, not only our governments, but also our private sector, because it's important that private parties understand that this organization is for them as well. It is actually primarily for them. Remember, we want to boost uh, employment. We want to reduce poverty. That all means industrialization. That all means value addition. And that all means having an active private sector across the continent. Thank you so much. Um, before I, I, I uh, turn over to, to Francis, can I just say uh, I forgot to do one very important thing, which is that I forgot to congratulate Kenya on the appointment. I'm not sure whether it's an I think it's an appointment. It's the appointment of the first sec uh, Chief Justice, uh, the Lady Justice Kaome Mata Karambu, um, it, it is such a, a wonderful thing as a woman, as a feminist, as a lawyer. I'm very proud of Kenya, and I'm very proud that you you have uh, made history by smashing the ceiling in this particular way. She has basically smashed the ceiling with her gavel. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. 
sorry I had uh, not unmuted, but thank you so much, Bettina, for that elaborate uh, um, uh, presentation and uh, response to Jacqueline's question. He's certainly a brilliant lawyer as to whether he's related to Jacqueline Silva, your boss. That is something I'll find out and share with you much later. But for now, allow me to uh, ask Frances Kenaki Todungu, who has raised her hand to come and also share with us uh, her perspective uh, on this uh, uh, subject matter. Uh, Frances, over to you. I do apologize. I'm sorry I didn't raise my hand. Oh, we see your hand up. But do you have any comment or anything to share with us? No, I mean, the comment is quite, what I could say is this is a great opportunity for lawyers in general. Um, uh, but I do really, um, what my concern is about capacity building for our lawyers, most of us who are practicing in, in Uganda. <laughs> in terms of um, uh, doing alternative dispute resolution work, uh, arbitration, uh, this is something which is not very high on. So it is uh, where we could get more support in terms of capacity building, if there could be more uh, trainings which are available such that we can actually embrace uh, this great opportunity. Because as um, we see here, most of the dispute resolutions are mainly going to be in terms of mediation work, um, arbitration, and there is a high need in supporting all private practitioners, all of us in terms of that. That's my appeal and how we can access that whether the East African um, Law Society can bring in more of these trainings that will be of great help. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you Francis. I know that uh, the president spoke earlier on about the partnership we have signed with Tralac uh, to do training and capacity building uh, for, for members of East African Law Society. I know that a lot of work is being done by the Secretariat and the Council. But I think it is important that people become members of ELS uh, so that they can access these opportunities. So, uh, but thank you so much for that intervention. Uh, I would like to ask, um, uh, to ask uh, uh, Esther Katende, if you're online, uh, we have seen that um, you spoke about if we don't get organized, then the big boys are going to get organized and seize these opportunities. I would like you to speak into that. How does, uh, I mean, a small law firm get organized? And I know you are also an organizational expert. You know, maybe speak to the practical realities because sometimes people may look at this as something that is at a distance from their practice. You may want to share some of your insights about how we can get organized rather than being organized uh, by other law firms, especially those from out of Africa. Because I have seen since uh, the launch of this agreement that the big law firms in London and uh, New York are really interested in Africa. And I must say, I have seen increased uh, you know, um, activity around organizing, uh, you know, themselves to seize opportunities brought by this agreement. How can we organize without moving out? Thank you, Francis. One of the things I think about on sports is the, the importance of institutionalizing our practice. You find most of the law firms are um, are run principally by the partners, you know, and there are no institutional structures in place. If the partners are not there, the, the system is not effective. So I think one of the most efficient ways right now is to institutionalize so that you have a business that you can partner with someone else. Like you've said, many players are going to be interested and are already interested in joining the firms in, in Africa, you know or in East Africa. So I think one of the biggest things that we should do is to institutionalize our businesses, you know, get things streamlined. 
So that it's not a one man show, it's not a two men show. That is one of the things. But beside that, I wanted to add on to Petina's comment and Ivan's question concerning why, whether the, the CFTA would be effective, the dispute settlement body will be effective. One of the reasons the WTO dispute settlement body was not taken on seriously by African countries is because of the cost. Was support that was given by the uh, very high for government. Now you'll find that, for example, implement, you know, the ES to be, but we've come a long way. And they've been putting in place implementation mechanisms, you know, the NTB, you know, committees, and all those things have been weeding out slowly but surely, like NTBs, for example. So, and how has this been done? The private players, the sugar industry, the, you know, the rice guys, they go to the ministries, the ministry is responsible, and the ministries take the matter on. It has been largely dealt with at a political level, but has been effective. So I imagine if the DSB of the Africa Continental Trade Agreement is, is, is effective, I think it will be as well very effective. That is what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. I will um, uh, take this opportunity to uh, quickly invite uh, Honorable David Ocheng. And uh, David Ocheng is a panelist uh, this afternoon, but uh, uh, he needs no introduction. He is a trade law expert. He is the MP for Ugenia. He understands the private sector. He has uh, legislated on these matters of trade law. He holds uh, a bachelor's of laws from Moy University in Kenya and master's in international law and economics from the World Trade Institute University of Bern, Switzerland. And uh, uh, David, in about five minutes, share with us your perspectives on this subject. And I know that this is a dear to you and uh, within five minutes, not from you. Thank you so much, Senior Limara. And I want to say I'm so sorry. We are having a, an interesting debate in the Kenyan Parliament, so I wasn't able to I wasn't able to join you earlier. I I had uh, just a bit a bit of Esther's interventions about um, these settlements and how we can um, participate in that. But I, I will pick it from the point of angle that as Africa, I think first of all, you have to produce. I'm sure I think I talked about that earlier. If you don't produce, if we don't have something to sell to each other, if you don't have the quantities of products that we can sell to each other, or even services we can, services we can sell to each other, then all the things you talk about are, are basically perfunctory. What must happen is, and, and here I speak as a trade expert, but also as a politician now, that we've we spend so much time as Africans in negotiations. And I can tell you, Chair, we follow all negotiations to the D. We participate in them, we prepare for them, we sign those documents, we come back home, and as a person now who has worked in both the private sector, I've worked for government uh, for ministries, and I've also worked now in the third arm of government. I tell you that. Parliament has a very strong role to play in ensuring the implementation, just to pack, I want to speak on this one, implementation of these agreements and ensuring that the countries that sign these agreements benefit from them. Most parliaments now in Africa appropriate monies to ministries. Most parliaments in Africa now oversight these ministries. Most parliaments in Africa now are able to, you know, pass policies that would give these countries new direction, new impetus, close all those doors, new, new impetus and new ways of doing things. And so unless we involve parliaments from day one that we now want to negotiate an agreement with among ourselves, Africa, we are negotiating an agreement among ourselves as ESC. We are negotiating among ourselves as SEMA, among ourselves as you know, SADA, unless that happens, and therefore the whole rubric of government is informed of what's happening, these agreements 
are signed and they are left to just shock dust in the ministries. Number two is that I believe that our ministries, our governments, but above all again our parliaments, must then now play a role in stimulating the growth of the private sector. In the laws we make, in the policies that we make, and in the provisions of money that we make at level of uh, police intervention and legal interventions, to put our monies where our mouths are. I mean, let me give an example of what happened in Kenya recently. We, we, we spent what most people say is double the amount of money that was required to put up a railway line from Mombasa, what they're calling a, a standard gauge railway, from Mombasa to Nairobi. A huge budget, uh, you know, something in, in the regions of Kenya shillings, 550 billion. And when this process started, the Chinese contractor said, we can't use the Kenyan cement. We can't use the Kenyan steel. And so for a whole nine months, they used to bring in Chinese cement and Chinese steel. The private sector had to make noise. And ask, what is this that is lacking in our in our production of cement that we can't change so that we use our own cement? From this noise, the, the private sector being organized, after eight months, they were not allowed to now supply Chinese as a contractor with the Kenyan cement, having put what the Chinese were saying were, were not there. As we speak today, uh, Chairperson, in Nairobi, most buildings are being done by the Chinese, and they come with prefabricated walls. I mean, we, we, uh, the Indians, you know, they are coming with walls already done, meaning they are importing into Africa sand, cement, and even water and soil, because all this is, you know, is, is implicit in, 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 in a wall. And so it's for us to determine the kind of things that we're going to allow to come into our countries. But above all, there must be leadership at the continental level. We cannot be signing these agreements, Chairperson. And then after two, three months, we cut what you call, you call we cut slack for our neighbors. Or, you know, uh, Chad wants this, please, can we talk about this? Can we allow them this concession? Or South Africa wants this. So, so we are undermining our own agreements. If you look at, for example, the building blocks to the ACFTA, the ESC, the SADAC, the COMESA. There's a lot of non-compliance that comes about because of countries not just agreeing to follow what they have, that they have signed on to the latter. And, and so, so much, in my opinion, will need to be done in ensuring that the countries are able to enforce what they have signed. Now, I'm sure my time is little, but in terms of rules of origin also, parliaments will have to be asked, to be called upon to domesticate the rules of origin, improve them, allow, you know, let me give another example here, that Egypt, for example, today, is able to import paper products from India and Oman, duty-free, quota-free, into Cairo. A Kenyan producer and a Ugandan producer can only export this from Oman at 25% duty. You know what happens, Chairman? So instead of a Kenyan or Ugandan going to India and Oman, the Kenyan would rather go to uh, wait and go and buy fish products in Egypt and bring to Kenya. Because if you, if you are able to, if you were to import from India direct, you have to pay 25%. So the Egyptian product starts at 0%, you are starting at 25%. We need to agree on how to deal with bilaterals that have been done by the African countries with the rest of the world. If you're able to, if you're not going to undermine the ACFTA. Uh, uh, chairperson, there are also a lot of legal reforms that will have to be done, especially in terms of removing the non tariff barriers and above all, operationalizing the trade facilitation agreements that are, are concerned, the you know, things that will make trade easier because the biggest barriers, the largest barriers, the most prevalent barriers in trade in, in, in the world now are in, are in Africa trade. So unless time is spent in doing that, we will just be doing nothing. And then on services, I think there's a couple of laws that will need to be changed to ensure that we're able to move across the four modes of services. How do we ensure that the legal reforms are you know, done at the local level? And this is done in a concerned manner. Note that Uganda has changed its laws, Ethiopia has not, Ethiopia has changed its laws, Chad has not, or Morocco has not. And therefore, the, you move from this border, you pass smoothly, the next border you go to, you have run of work because the other country did not. And so a continental framework for monitoring 
implementation. A container framework for enforcing implementation. And what you talked about already, a computational framework that can be used for ensuring that we are sorting out disputes in a good way. And on that point, and I'm sure Katende talked about it uh, especially, we must learn to use our systems that we have set up in the laws. We should not try to run a, a, a convent them. If you have set up a system for sorting disputes, let's build them by testing them. Let's build them by using them. And let lawyers learn that when a dispute comes to your law firm, then the first place to go is not the high court in your country. We try to learn what are some of the possible avenues for sorting out this, this kind of uh, disputes. Is it the good offices? Is it the panel system? Is it the court? Where do we go as, as a system are set up within the protocol? Uh, Chairperson, I've uh, bypassed my time, but I wish I'd given this uh, more time. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, thank you, Honorable Chen. Thank you for again uh, bringing it back uh, near uh, what uh, near our home in terms of what the countries need to do to effectualize the the dream in terms of laws, in terms of practice, in terms of policy. Uh, what we hear from you that there is a lot of work to be done to get this dream going. Thank you so much. We will um, um, ask the panelists, there are some questions in the chat for you to look at. So you will be responding to those that you think you are able to respond to. But I wanted Rose to return and uh, briefly tell us about um, your experience in getting the private sector to support these processes. Listening to Honre Cheng, it seems that uh, we cannot, as lawyers, uh, sit still and wait for things to happen. We have to engage. We have to get the rules of origin sorted out. We have to get the domestic uh, uh, legal systems, uh, you know, aligned to the, to the framework agreement. How are we going to, to do this work? Maybe you'd like to share with us uh, how the lawyer today should work with the private sector uh, to get uh, this dream actualized. Rose, uh, could you share with us some of the practical lessons you think uh, we lawyers should, uh, should, should take? Uh, thank you, Francis. Yeah. Private thank sector. You, Francis. Yeah, thank you, Francis. Uh, uh, I think that's a really good question because when you hear of private sector, uh, associations, you're thinking of uh, export, import, you're thinking of commodities, you're not thinking of uh, services. Uh, I think it's important now that, uh, that uh, uh, professionals who are offering services and can offer services beyond their countries take their professional associations very seriously. For example, this uh, ELS and also the Law Society of Kenya. We also have an association of professionals in Kenya. That is the uh, the particular one that engages uh, engages the State Department of Trade, which is tasked with the negotiation. So for me, what, what I would say is that it's important now you start getting involved in this because gone are the times whereby a decision is made or um, uh, an agreement is signed and is passed to, to just you know implement it. This is something that is going to concern you, especially as a lawyer, it's going to concern you because we have uh, the protocol on, on trading services, whereby you now can be able to, you know, negotiate to see which country can I be able to go offer my services, which country can be, can can be able to establish my firm. So, if the persons at, at the negotiating table do not know what your demands are, then they will just guess. You know, they will guess, and when they guess, then you get a raw deal. And uh, I'll just give an example of uh, the WTO when the one question was being established. Uh, uh, far back in uh, you know in the, in the mid or mid 90s a lot of countries you know made mistakes by committing to things that they could not be able to go back on you know it became so difficult to unravel the commitments that they had already made and i think lawyers you are uh, very well so get involved and this is not going to be the only agreement that uh, that uh, that country a country will sign you know your country will sign another agreement like for example kenya we are in the process of negotiating with the us a free trade agreement how many of you lawyer, Kenyan lawyers of that or have expressed interest to be able to have given your input on that? 
So get involved. Uh, don't wait for things to be consequences or you say, oh, it was done by other people. Now let us try and do it. So for me, that is my experience. My experience is that the professional sector, professionals have not been coming very strongly at the table when it comes to negotiating trade agreements. And that needs to change so that you're at the table and, determ and you're determining what, you know, what, what, is the, what is there. Because if you leave it to the, uh, to the lawyer who is attached to the attorney general, she might look at it from one point of view. You know, she might look at it from the point of view of her just working in government. But there are so many fields in, in, in law. You know, there is, there, there, it's very wide. So we need to look at it. You know, you need to be there so that you can be able to speak for yourself. That's yeah. what I would say. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. I just wanted you to speak to that because uh, many people ask for opportunities in the trade law sector. But uh, like you ably discussed, these opportunities just don't fall. For us to benefit from um, the AFCTA, we have to reach out. We have to build networks across the private sector. Some of the ideas will involve us working with uh, our clients to actually create markets for them. And so it's a, a new way of practice. You have to innovate around your practice to benefit from it. It's not going to be business as usual where you wait for instructions in your law firm. It is going to be something that you have to think. Honorable David Ocheng has discussed uh, the laws that we need in place. Some of you lawyers who are good in consultancies will be engaging the ministries to say, I can draft this law. Some of you are going to be looking at measures that are inconsistent with this agreement. You will be reaching out to the clients through their associations to speak to them about the inconsistency of these measures versus the agreement and generating work for yourself. Now we- I'd like to add something, Francis, if you don't mind. Uh, I, I just like to, to mention that there is a shortage of, of trade lawyers in, in the African continent. Not enough people are going, are taking up trade law as a serious uh, profession. And I saw this firsthand last year when I was in Arusha, whereby they were trying to get trade lawyer or who has a PhD in, in, in trade law to come and offer one of the lectures because I think one of the lectures could not be able to come in. And really we could not be able to find, it was, there, there, there were like two or three, you know, uh, that were available, uh, they were not even available, they were available at the same time. So you could, uh, we can already see there's a, there's a shortage in this particular uh, 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 field of law. And with this particular agreement, there's a demand for that. We have a school in Arusha called uh, uh, Trapka, uh, Esami, you can go Google it. They give to countries who, or students from countries of least developing countries. And if you're a developing country, they will give you if you're a lady. So myself, I'm part of that. Petina teaches in, in that uh, particular institution. So if you can take advantage of that for the master's program in trade law, you can go and do a, you know, and the opportunities you can teach, you can be able to, you know, serve in these, you know, organs that have been set up as secretariat. So for me, I see there's a shortage of that. I've seen a law firm, I think Anjarwana and Kana in Kenya have set up a, a section for trade, doing international trade. And I think these are the people who are going to rip up the benefits of this agreement very fast because they've seen that opportunity. So I encourage you guys to look at that. Thank you. Thank you for highlighting those opportunities because there are people who are on the chat who are asking and they have these qualifications, how they can seize opportunities as international trade lawyers. And I think Chair, that Chair, Chair, before that. you close that part, before you close it, before you close it, Chair, can I say something on that issue also? Yes, yes, uh, Honorable, proceed. Chair, especially for the lawyers who may already have, already have qualifications, Chair, I, I always say that th there's nothing wrong in volunteering. Volunteering to work with the Ministry of Trade, volunteering to work with the private sector organizations. Just volunteer yourself your time. Get your time so that you're able to understand how these things work. The practical, because most of us who have gone to school in this area would probably have the theoretical experience. But just volunteer. I personally, my experience with trade law is that I practice trade law 80% of my time. And it started through volunteering. Volunteer with the Ministry of Trade, with the AG's offices. Volunteer wherever you can volunteer so that you're able to learn the practical aspects of 
this particular you know trade but number two also and, and very importantly in my opinion is that trade law work is not everyday work that you will be briefed on and so i also want to share with you that between 2007 and 2016 most of the works that i got and i didn't get small work it was a lot of work that i got during that period was self-generated you go to a ministry they're looking for someone to help and just do TORs. And they can't get anybody. You take that, do the TOR, then you can go and do a team and work on that. You go to another ministry, you find that they're looking for someone who can just help them work on a concept not. So, so if, if you are not able to do that and wait at the end of the channel, then you will not get it. We, we need to get involved at every stage. And like Rono has said, in these negotiations, most of the time, the government has only one or two lawyers. If you're able to come in and give your free legal advice, even if you're not being paid, but you're giving this from where you sit, it's quite important. Number three is that <clears throat> some of us are gifted. We can write in the newspapers. We, we, we can be able to solicit work in that way, that you've written something, someone may not know you exist, but because you've done an article on the SCFT rules of origin or issue settlement or something on that, then someone will not, oh, there's somebody here. Let's get away of letting ourselves be known that we are around. I don't agree with that there's a dark of legal expertise in the area. The dark here, the, the problem here that is, is that we have so many, I know so many guys who went to law school with me, who have masters in trade law, but who cannot be able to find work, and therefore they relapse into the other, other practice areas because they're not able to crack into these kind of things. And so some of us yeah. who are blessed to be in this area must pull others into this area and enable them to also grow in the field, uh, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry for taking uh, you back. Thank you, Honorable David. Uh, we are coming to the end of this webinar. It is a two-hour webinar. As you know, we can't talk about everything, but we can tickle your mind, and then we can always have a follow-up discussion. Now, as we wrap up, I'm going to ask uh, the President will close, but I think President there are some questions that you'll speak to, uh, role of uh, what you can do about the young lawyers. I see a question on um, uh, generally what more can ELS do, but uh, David has answered that on the chat. But for the panelists, I think uh, somebody wants to know about uh, whether with um, uh, the current problems Africa is in, uh, uh, climate-wise, uh, whether we are able, where we lack skills and uh, the pressures of globalization, whether we are able to, you know, bring AFCTA to fruition in terms of realizing the objectives. So as you wrap up, I would like you to share with us your parting uh, uh, word, generally as uh, you think in regards to the topic. And then if there's anything you feel you want to respond to uh, from the chat, that is also something that I will leave to you to do. So we'll start with our keynote speaker, uh, Petina. We would uh, love to hear more from you and I'm sure we'll invite you again, but uh, please share with us your parting shots in about two, three minutes. Uh, I will uh, move straight to Rose, Rono, and then to Esther and David as we wait for Petina. Thank you so much, Francis. Uh, for me, I don't have much to say. It's just that I'm so happy uh, uh, that we've had this conversation. I always take opportunity to be able to capacity build on this agreement because I, I am very passionate about it. This is the second time I think I'm talking to the East Society last year. I talked on the WTO trade uh, uh, dispute resolution mechanism. So I look forward to us continuing to engage. Uh, if you need, especially if you're in Kenya and you need to connect to the, the State Department of Trade to be able to be part of the negotiations, you can to me and I can be able to ensure that you're in that invitation list uh, when they call for stakeholder engagement. So thank you very much for having me and I wish you a blessed evening. Uh, thank you, Rose. Thank you so much. Uh, Esther? Um, yes, I'd like to talk about two issues in closing. Number one, oh, concerning what the younger trade lawyers should do. Um, like David was saying, I believe no one in this world can give you a platform. You have to create that platform for yourself. 
one of the things I was mentored into when I was a younger lawyer is that no one is going to invite you to the table. You have to invite yourself and make your presence felt. So to the young lawyers, there are so many opportunities to make your presence felt in this digital world today. You know, tweet about the CFTA, write about it, speak about it, YouTube channel. I mean, there's so many opportunities. Make your presence felt and your knowledge known so that you're picked on as one of the people who are competent in this area. Yes, they say that there are not many trade lawyers. That's not really true. They are quite done. They are doing very many and diverse things. So many of the rules and the things that are going on, the different regional um, agreements and implementation are done by the trade lawyers. I'm sorry, I'm at the swimming pool watching my children. So that is one of the things I want to, to note. And then the second thing, someone said that all oh, the system is slow. In the comments, they were saying that that, that that implementation is very slow. I want to, to point out that yes, it is slow, but it is certain. Like Petina said, like Rose said, that they are running the run and they are talking the talk and they are walking the talk. So you might feel that it is not happening, but it is going to happen. Maybe now, not now, right now, but in the next 10, 20, 30 years. So what does that mean? Those of you who have children, because I'm passionate about children, prepare your children to compete in this world. Prepare your children to compete in the Africa that is coming, the Africa that is going to be like China. Don't raise them conventionally raise them in such a way that they are going to be able to outcompete or to get you know platforms whereby they can also make a valuable contribution in their time those are my closing remarks thank you very much thank you thank you thank you esther and i know esther is not only an authority on trade law she has also authored a good book on parenting uh, you can find it she's uh, very 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 intentional about raising the next generation of uh, Great Africans. Uh, Honorable David Ocheng, I know that the BBI reggae is uh, fully on, and you may wish to run back to Parliament, but uh, just yeah. share with us <laughs> your, your parting, parting shot. No. Then I move to Petina and uh, the President. I, 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 would, I, would just join, I would join Esther in what you just said that, uh, uh, Chairman, this is our time, and history will record our contribution towards this if we are proactive. We cannot give up. You know, anybody you see who has grown with China, with someone had to do it for them. And so we must make our contribution, have a little in this process to ensure that, you know, like someone said before, the old Africa is gone. Let's build, learn ourselves. Let's build our own capacity for the new Africa. That's what we can do as, boy, as men and women of Africa to ensure that we are proud of it because of the sweat that we put in make sure, making sure that the ACFTA becomes the tool for our industrialization. Thank you. I like the mantra that indeed the time is now. Uh, and uh, you know a great saying that uh, preparation meets opportunities. Thank you, Honorable, for emphasizing that. We need to be prepared so that we seize the opportunities existing. Petina, over to you. We want to take your parting uh, words of wisdom. Bettina, you may want to unmute, are you? Thank you so much, I'm sorry, I was muted. Yes, thank you so much. I, I was hoping Honorable David Ocheng would still be here because I wanted to tell him I'm that uh, one of the things that we will be doing as AFCFTA, in addition to reaching out to I'm government officials and to uh, the private sector is also engaging parliament because they are the ones who are ratifying the treaty and they are the ones who will be debating some of the issues around. So we'll be doing capacity building to Parliament as well. So I, I'm, I'm so delighted that you have a parliamentarian who is interested in trade issues taking part in this webinar. I want to also end on a similar note to Esther. I really, really, I'm, I'm hoping after this that Esther and I become, uh, you know, new best friends because I really enjoyed listening to her. And also, I really think that what she said is the essence of what AFCFTA is trying to do. Right. Remember, I mentioned the sommeliers, right? People who lay down wine, knowing this wine is going to be enjoyed or this whiskey is going to be enjoyed 50 years from now. They're not going to taste it. It's that vision that we are looking for, right? The AFCFTA is part of what is called Agenda 2063. I probably won't be around, you know, in 2063. And I've, I've, I've made my peace with that. 
but my son will be around and his children will be around. It's time for Africa to start thinking in terms of legacy issues. Yes, it's important to think about the now, about the present, but it's also important to build for the future. You know, there's this thing that's now uh, very popular uh, in, in African families, this idea of intergenerational wealth, right? You make your money, you leave it to your children, they leave it to their children. That's how the Rothschilds become the Rothschilds. That's how, you know, all these wealthy families become what is this idea of intergenerational wealth. And what we're trying to create is a form of intergenerational wealth. We're trying to create something that we leave to our children, that they leave to their children, right? So that one day people look at the history of this thing and say, ah, one of the first events that the AFCFTA held was for the East African Law Society. Do you see what I mean? So we're trying to create an institution that will may not answer all our problems today, but we're building it for the future because it's a legacy project that we're, you, we're doing for our children. Thank you so much. Thank you, Petina. What a wonderful way to conclude. Yes, um, we have to build uh, Africa for the future. We have to think about legacy. We certainly have a role to play as professionals. Lawyering is a calling and we are in, at such a point uh, in, uh, to influence things for the betterment of Africa. Indeed, there are opportunities, personal, but we should never lose the bigger picture that together we can make Africa better. And I believe that uh, Vision 2063 is really about making Africa better for our children, for our grandchildren. But it starts with us playing our role. I would like to ask um, the president to step in and make his uh, closing remarks. Uh, what remains for me is to thank sincerely our panelists, Petina Gapa, thank you so much for your insights. We will uh, continue to engage on this subject. Allow me to thank uh, Honorable David Ochen for a job well done. Allow me as well to thank uh, uh the, the two ladies who have done a very wonderful job you know uh discussing and uh, sharing their insights esther katende and uh, associate lawyer rose uh, rono thank you so much for a great job i will um, ask the president to i invite the president of east africa law society to come and make closing remarks i am as well told that uh, the Deputy Secretary General of uh, FCTA is on the call. I think the President, you will, uh, you will uh, handle the protocols. Over to you, President. Thank you so much, um, President Francis Gemara. Thank you so much. Thank you to the panelists. I think before I make my conclude, my 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 uh, my final remarks, I'm going to ask the. Secretary General of the FCTA in just about two, three minutes to say something. Mr. Paul Okech, I would like to invite you uh, to make a few remarks before you are members of the East Africa Law Society and we'll be very grateful to hear from you. Paul? And I think we lost him. Okay, well, I think we'll just proceed. I think we, we've lost him. We can't seem to find him. All right. Um, let, me, let me just make two final points. One is to thank the panelists for the excellent presentations you have made. I want to specially thank Ms. Petina Gapa, thank you for sparing your time off the, off the beach, of the sessions that you are holding. We are extremely grateful as East Africa Law Society. Thank you so much. I would also like to thank uh, Honorable uh, Rose Rono, Honorable, is he still on the call? I think it's Honorable David yeah. Ocheng. Thank you. You've always come to East Africa Law yes, Society yeah. whenever we have requested. Yes, we thank yes, you so yeah. much. Um, I also want to thank Esther Katende. Thank you so much. 
and thank you for sharing your words of wisdom not only concerning the concerning trade but also the jewish phenomenon i think that's what uh, uh petina and esther were also sharing intergenerational wealth uh the jewish phenomenon that's an excellent book that i would urge everyone to read it shares a lot of insights on how we should uh, bring up our children and how we should be able to 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 look at intergenerational wealth thank you so much i think the final point i would like to make is as els we are committed to building capacity we are not going to sleep and this is the beginning there's no time for excuses there's no time for complaints there is no time for 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 there'll be no time to say where were we it is our time and we are going to do all we can to help build the capacity uh, it, you may be pleased to note uh, that we have already partnered with Trapka, an institution in South Africa, and we are going to start to offer specialized training in trade. I think the first training will only have 45 participants. Please ensure, number one, that you are a member. You are a member and you're a fully paid up member if you want to take charge of those opportunities. As ELS and the Governing Council, we are committed to that journey, and we are going to be committed to supporting you Ms. Petna and FTA, whenever we come along, please um, come and share your thoughts and your guidance. We shall be very grateful. On that note, allow me adjourn this webinar. There will be another trade, trade, trade webinar, and we will invite you all again. Thank you for the wonderful evening. Thank you to our participants. Thank you to our attendees. Thank you, Professor Frederick Sempe, who I think I saw you on. Um, Thank you, everyone, and thank you for coming. Until next time, have a good evening. See you soon. Thank you.